Hi, everyone. I just wanted to welcome you to the uh, session three for today for the Boeing Quantum Creators Prize Symposium. Um, so this session will be revolving around novel quantum systems. Um, so I'll be moderating it along with Dave DeMille. Um, and so we'll go ahead and kick it off with our first presenter. Uh, so our first presenter will be Sherry Zhang, uh, who is a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kate, for the kind introduction. And thank you very much for the organizers to putting this event together. I'm really honored uh, to receive the prize and present my work uh, here centered on uh, bridging the connectivity gap with photons in waveguides. So in this talk, I will mainly focus on my uh, work uh, I did at uh, Caltech uh, centered on superconducting circuits. Uh, and at the very end, I will mention very br briefly uh, the work I have been uh, starting to do uh, in the last few months at UC Berkeley. Um, right. So in this um, quantum summit, we have heard a lot of uh, exciting progress uh, centered on quantum hardware, um, uh, on those AMO systems, as well as the solid state systems. And for most of the platforms, we can lay uh, them on the scale versus connect, uh, controllability uh, chart. Uh, for the scale, uh, I mean like the number of qubits we have in the system, and for the controllability, I include not just the individual particle level control, but also the control fidelity, as well as the connectivity. So here uh, is uh, an example of the 1D nearest neighbor connected uh, uh, qubit chain, and uh, compared to this one, uh, this, uh, this 1D chain has much higher connectivity uh, than the first row. Uh, so for most of those systems, uh, uh, currently they are at this lower uh, left corner where we have those NISC devices, we can explore different uh, physics uh, with them. And uh, for all of them, uh, the eventual goal is to reach this upper right corner uh, where, where we have large scale uh, controllable system that we can explore for, for example, photon quantum computation and other exciting applications. And different systems have their uh, own advantages and challenges to reach this goal. And in my PhD, I have been mainly focusing on um, pushing the frontier of superconducting circuits. So superconducting circuits on this chart is probably uh, around this location. Um, so big companies have been trying to uh, push the number of qubits to larger scales. For example, we have uh, more than 400 superconducting qubits on a single chip uh, from IBM. And in terms of controllability, uh, superconducting qubits is probably one of the platforms that uh, reaches very, um, very high level of individual particle level control. Uh, and also the control fidelity has also reached or even surpassed their surface code uh, threshold. But in terms of connectivity, most if not all of the multi-qubit architectures only has nearest neighbor connectivity as shown uh, like those two examples, or this one is even uh, sparser. And uh, so here, um, we want to have higher uh, connectivities. We already heard uh, from uh, Stephanie uh, yesterday about a general version, general public version of why we want higher connectivity. And here, I'll just give a little more technical version. Um, so if we have longer range gates in our system uh, towards the photon quantum computation goals, um, it helps us a lot in, term, in terms of reaching quantum error correction, as well as compiling different uh, circuits that we want for algorithms and uh, quantum chemistry simulations. So for quantum error correction, this is an example. Uh, if we have uh, only nearest neighbor connectivity in a 2D plane, then there's a natural constraint between the number of logical qubits we can encode uh, versus the code distance if we have a fixed number of physical qubit at our disposal. And that results in a very large overhead if we use surface code uh, to perform the error correction. And one possible solution is to go to higher rate uh, quantum error correction error correcting codes, for example, the LDPC code. Uh, however, those code naturally requires longer range circuit connectivity. So that uh, is uh, our grand goal of photon quantum computation. And before reaching that goal, we can also consider NISC error applications. And one of the most important one is this uh, analog quantum simulation. Uh, and in this case, if we have longer range connectivity in the system, then it enables us to explore a larger uh, range, a wider range of Hamiltonians um, that can simulate uh, interesting physics of matter, uh, like Andrew uh, talked about in the last session. And uh, also for variational quantum algorithms, uh, people have also shown that if we have tunable range of connectivity in our circuit, it actually requires smaller circuit depth uh, to reach uh, the ground state at high fidelity. 
So with, with those all in mind, we uh, really have the motivation of uh, achieving higher connectivity in superconducting circuits. And how can we do that? One uh, solution is to uh, use some non-local degrees of freedom to mediate those interactions. For example, we can put all the qubits into a simple cavity. Uh, and the problem of that is a cavity is a zero-dimensional structure. And if we want to keep the scalability also in mind, then we also want to find a structure that is intrinsically extensible. For example, uh, this waveguide structure. And when we couple multiple qubits onto the same waveguide, then we can use the photons in the waveguide to mediate interactions between uh, qubits that are separated by a longer distance. So this is um, the basic concept. And here, uh, we implement those ideas uh, with superconducting circuits. And the first thing is to have the waveguide in the system. And we choose to implement um, our waveguide uh, with this coupled uh, 1D coupled cavity array models with nearest neighbor coupling. And this model gives us uh, this um, uh, type binding model that has this cosine shape dispersion uh, with two band gaps, the lower band gap and the upper band gap. And to implement this model with superconducting circuits, we can use this capacitive coupled LC resonator array. And on top of that, uh, we can couple our ferret uh, superconducting qubit, the transmon qubit, onto um, the site. So in this case, when the qubit frequency is inside the band gap frequency, there is no propagating mode for the qubit to decay. Um, uh, and instead, it hybridizes with the passband mode and forms the dressed state. In this case, it is um, what we call the qubit photon bound state. And in this case, um, this um, spatial extent of the qubit photon bound state is determined by the qubit detuning relative to the band edge. So if you have smaller detuning, we have more extended bound state. And if we have larger detunings, this uh, spatial extent is more restricted. And now we can couple multiple qubits onto the same structure, like this. And the overlap of between different qubit photon bound state gives us the um, uh, photon media interactions between different sites. Um, so this is exchange type interaction, and it also follows the same uh, spatial profile of the, as those qubit photon bound state, which is this exponential uh, decay profile. And more interestingly, uh, this, can, uh, this interaction range is also controlled by the qubit detuning relative to the band edge. And uh, with this detuning, we can control both uh, the range and the strength of the coupling between uh, different qubits. So this really forms um, uh, the basis of having tunable coupling uh, range and strength in a system. So now that we have um, uh, those ideas laid out, we can uh, go ahead and make this, uh, make this uh, device. And this is the backbone of this metamaterial waveguide formed by 42 metamaterial waveguides. And here is a zoomed in view uh, of the uh, two of the resonators. And um, this is a lumped element resonator with near field capacitive coupling. On top of that, uh, at the cent uh, center of the device, we have 10 transmog qubits colored in orange. And each of them has their individual x, y, and z control lines, as well as the readout resonator. So uh, we achieve individual uh, control and readout on each of the 10 qubits. And further, this is also a scalable architecture in the sense that we can just uh, um, fill those empty sites with real qubits and extend the length of the waveguide without changing the dispersion relation. And now we have this device. We can explore what kind of uh, Hamiltonian we can implement with this device. So again, we start from our uh, transmog qubit. Uh, we know that it is an unharmonic oscillator. And if we couple the transmog qubit onto the waveguide uh, in the band gap frequency, um, it, uh, this qubit photon bound state also inherits uh, this enharmonic oscillator level uh, structure. So this can be veiled as a bosonic site and, uh, for, for microwave photons. So the energy required to put one microwave photon into the system is in general different from putting the second photon into the system. And this uh, enharmonicity gives us this on-site interaction term. And further, when we couple uh, multiple sites uh, together, uh, we also care about uh, the hopping of the uh, microwave photons between different sites. And that gives us this hopping term. So combining the two terms together actually gives us this extended version of the bose hubbard model. And I call it an extended version because uh, the standard bose hubbard model only has the nearest neighbor uh, hopping terms. 
So now we can uh, uh, explore different terms in the uh, system. We can start from this more interesting hopping term. Uh, so we can characterize that by qubit, uh, pairwise qubit measurement. Um, and uh, uh, from this Rabi oscillation, we can extract the strength of the hopping as a function of uh, qubit frequency. So here uh, we can uh, map out um, from the nearest neighbor pairs all the way up to the pairs at, separated at the end of the 10 qubit chain. And at uh, each um, frequency, uh, we can see that the, uh, uh, the, the hopping range decays exponentially as a function of qubit separation. And when we extract this uh, exponent, we can see it is indeed tunable as a function of uh, qubit frequency, and therefore verify that we have tunable range uh, coupling in our system. And now that we have um, this device, we can think about uh, probably probing some many-body dynamics. And the previous slide only shows pairwise measurement. Uh, but here, we can use a more powerful me method that is actually described by, by Adam uh, in the previous session. Uh, let the uh, many-body dynamics is itself uh, speak about the Hamiltonian. So here, I will describe uh, our experimental procedure. So first, uh, we can initialize the system uh, by detuning all the 10 qubits and uh, randomly uh, put five excitations, five microphotons, onto uh, some selected sites, and then tune them onto resin with each other and turn on this uh, interaction. And for after time tau, we can detune them again and perform um, the measurement on each of the site. And because we have the um, uh, close to hardcore uh, both Hubbard uh, Hamiltonian, each of the site gives us either zero or one. And in the end, we have um, a bit stream. So by performing those measurements for multiple times and with different initial states, we can accumulate some statistics of those uh, bit strings. And this is the experimental side. And on the theory side, uh, we can perform the same uh, similar simulated experiment and get uh, the similar uh, bit string uh, statistics. I won't go into the detail of the math, but uh, from those, uh, by comparing those bit string st statistics, uh, we can actually find the best parameter that describes the Hamiltonian. So here's the result at uh, this frequency, and it uh, agrees very well with the pairwise qubit measurement, and also gives us the, um, uh, the sign of the hopping that is not available from other measurements. And now that we have characterized uh, those system parameters, we can also learn about the uh, effect of um, longer range hopping um, uh, onto the many body dynamics. And in this case, when we have a shorter range, um, uh, nearest neighbor hopping, the system is close to this uh, spin one half x1 model, which is integrable. And if we go to longer range hopping, then this uh, system actually becomes chaotic. So we want to probe this uh, evolution in our system, uh, this crossover in our system. Uh, so we do that by sending two microphotons onto the middle sites and let it evolve to, perf uh, to perform the quantum walk measurement. Uh, so here's the result uh, when the, uh, when the uh, the hopping range is very uh, small, we can see this very clear pattern. And as we go to uh, longer and longer uh, range hoppings, we can see this pattern gets more and more blurry. And to be more quantitative, we can again look at the bit string statistics and quantify it by the second moment. So here is the result for the integrable model from our simulation. And uh, from uh, the ergodic uh, Hamiltonian, we expect it settles down to this uh, general value over here. And for those two experimental curves, uh, we can see that it settles down uh, to uh, the ergodic limit at shorter and shorter time scales. And that um, um, suggests we have this crossover in our system. So I don't have time to go into the details, but in uh, further experiments, we also verify that uh, this, <clears throat> this, uh, uh, this ergodic hematoma, uh, this, this result, this is um, coming from the uh, coherent chaotic evolution instead of the decoherence. And we can pinpoint uh, this effect of longer range hopping in our system. <clears throat> and in the last technical slide, I just want to quickly uh, show the other effort I'm uh, working on at UC Berkeley right now. It's also united under uh, the bridging the connectivity gap with actually silicon photonics. And in this case, we focus on uh, T-centers uh, in silicon, which is very nice spin photon interface. Um, and we fabricate uh, those silicon photonic structures uh, to couple uh, multiple photonic crystal cavities with a silicon waveguide. And in this case, we can perform gas tuning. That gives us picometer a precision, almost uh, programmable uh, tuning of those um, cavities. And we're working to integrate T-centers into uh, those different cavities that can give us, for example, multiplexed single photon sources, as well as a repeater nodes. 
So um, uh, I would like to uh, thank my um, collaborators, both at Caltech and UC Berkeley, as well as our theory uh, collaborators and funding uh, sources. With that, um, I would like to leave you with the, a summary slide and a shameless announcement that I will be starting my own group at Columbia University in 2025, uh, January. So if you're interested in those uh, different topics, feel free to contact me. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Um, all right, so we have time for a quick question. Yes. Thanks for the nice talk. Can you say what uh, violations of the hardcore boson model look like in your system and how likely they are to actually occur? Right, right. So basically, uh, in our system, um, uh, the on-site interaction term, which is the inharmonicity, uh, U, which is about 200, uh, larger than 200 megahertz in our system. And that is uh, at least one order of magnitude larger than any other, uh, for example, hopping terms uh, or disorder in our system. Uh, so we don't expect to see much of the like second excitation uh, in our system, for example, doublons. Uh, and probably the effect would be like less than 1% uh, of error that might cause some like um, difference between like uh, numerical simulations and our experimental uh, result, uh, but I think the uh, effect would be quite small there. Just as, I guess, quick follow-up, what would you actually measure, though, if you had a double on in a particular well? Like, what would actually be the observable that you would measure when you try to read out your state of your qubit? Right, right. So in that case, we would need to uh, calibrate uh, the readout on the, so the transmon has like ground excited and F state, so double excited state. So we need to calibrate our readout of the F state as well uh, to be able to uh, like uh, read out uh, very efficiently about this population there. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sherry. That was a great talk. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dave Duell from the University of Chicago, co-chairing this session, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Kevin Singh, uh, who's one of our local uh, young stars working in the uh, group of Hannes Bernian in the PME. So uh, welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Oh, wait, maybe it's this one. Okay, no, it's this one. Uh, hey everyone, my name is uh, Kevin Singh. I'm a postdoc in the Bernian Lab uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, and today I'm excited to, to tell you about a large, a special large scale quantum device that we've built uh, right over there at the Pritzker School for Molecular Engineering. So let's uh, dive right in. Um, actually, before I tell you about that experiment, um, let me first talk about a very important technological innovation, and that's uh, optical tweezer arrays. So optical tweezer arrays are arrays of tightly focused laser light that we can use to trap and confine single uh, neutral atoms and molecules. One of the wonders of this platform is that we can dynamically reconfigure these optical tweezers uh, uh, in real time to form uh, uh, defect-free arbitrary patterns of interest. For example, here's a laser in use sign made by rearranging our cesium atoms. Because of the power of this platform, there are a lot of very important applications uh, that tweezer arrays have, namely for studying uh, many body physics, for, uh, for metrology, uh, for coupling atoms to nanophotonic devices and cavities, uh, for studying chemistry, uh, and something that's gathered a lot of attention uh, recently, uh, which is for quantum information science. And so with that in mind, the rest of my talk will focus on using uh, optical tweezer arrays uh, to build atom array quantum processors. Uh, and with that in mind, here's a ket symbol formed by our cesium atoms. So uh, how, do we, how do we make these things? So here's a five by five grid of cesium atoms in our lab. Uh, the way uh, we typically, uh, so each uh, tweezer has a single atomic qubit, and let's say we want to scale the number of atomic cubics, so qubits, so the way we would do that is just add more tweezers. So like recent work, for example, in the Lucan group used 289 such atomic qubits um, by scaling the tweezer number uh, to demonstrate uh, quantum speedup of the maximum independent set problem. Additionally, these atomic qubits, they have really long-lived qubit states that we can use for computation. Uh, recent work, uh, for example, with the terbium and strontium nuclear spins uh, demonstrated coherence times uh, much greater than about a second. Uh, 
Additionally, when we want to make the atoms interact, we'll temporarily promote the electronic state of these atoms to high-lying Rydberg states and use the strong dipole-dipole interactions between them to generate, uh, to generate gates and perform entangling uh, operations. And these entangling operations, that we heard, as we heard um, earlier today, uh, have now fidelities much greater than 99%, which is quite exciting. Uh, additionally, recent uh, uh, work has allowed uh, researchers to also perform algorithms with individual addressing. But despite all of these wonderful properties, there are still a number of challenges. Uh, probably the biggest challenge is measurements. So the way measurements are ordinarily done in these systems is via fluorescence measurements, which is long, destructive, and often not qubit specific. Uh, because measurements are hard, then auxiliary qubit assisted protocols are also hard. Moreover, we have to contend with atom loss during deep circuits. And lastly, there's uh, no real straightforward way on how to do individual addressing on a large scale. So that brings me to the outline of my talk. In the first part, I'll discuss our two-species atom array and how it addresses many of the challenges I noted on, my pre on the previous slide. Then I'll discuss mid-circuit operations and how we can perform mid-circuit measurements on one of the elements to perform feedback operations on the other. And lastly, I'll discuss Rydberg interactions and some of our first results on, using, uh, on creating interspecies interactions between rubidium and cesium. So first, two-species array. So to give you a flavor of why you would want two elements in the first place, let's first talk about how these atom arrays are typically made. So this is an illustration of an iridium atom array. So often when we want to get quantum information from the system, what we'll do is we'll shine what's called the MOT light or the D2 line of rubidium on the atoms. Uh, this is 780 for rubidium. And this is great because it causes all the atoms to fluoresce, so we get single site detection of all the atoms. But it has rather disastrous consequences for the coherence of the array. So if you're using hyperfine qubits, for example, it destroys all the coherence. Um, so if you want to do quantum non-demolition measurements or repeated measurements, it's very challenging to do it this way. Our approach uh, to solving this issue is to introduce another element into the array, one with vastly different atomic resonances, uh, for example, cesium. So then when it comes time to get information from the array, what we'll instead do is now use Rydberg interactions to generate correlations between the rubidium and cesium atoms. And then instead of fluorescing the rubidium atoms, we'll fluoresce the cesium atoms. And because this is about 70 nanometers away from the rubidium line, uh, these photons are all um, uh, very far away, and so the rubidium atoms uh, remain coherent. And so this is a very straightforward idea, but it has a number of very important applications for reducing crosstalk in the system, for enabling non-demolition measurements with an eye towards error detection and correction, for large-scale multi-qubit control, and also for auxiliary qubit assisted protocols. So several years ago, we, decided, we set out to build a device that realizes both of these arrays. Uh, this is what we designed. And this is what we built. And then if you look at the center, uh, you'll see a bright uh, fluorescing ball of gas of rubidium and cesium atoms at the center. And that's where all of our experiments start. So from this gas, we then shine optical tweezers uh, onto that MOT to pluck out individual atomic qubits of both either rubidium or cesium. And so the way we generate those tweezer arrays is using two trapping technologies, uh, spatial light modulators and acoustal optic deflectors. So the spatial light modulators form static tweezer arrays in which we keep the rubidium and cesium atoms confined. And then we use a single pair of cross acoustal optic deflectors. Uh, these are now our mobile tweezers uh, that we can change with RF tones to pick up atoms at their sites and move them over to the places that we want them to be. So uh, it took a fair bit of time uh, to align these optics, but I'm excited to show you what typical fluorescence measurements look like. Uh, and they look like this. So here, each yellow dot is a single cesium atom. Each blue dot is a single rubidium atom. The spacing between the cesium atoms is 10 microns, and the spacing between the rubidium and cesium atoms is 7 microns. And these are the distances that we would want to work at uh, for strong Rydberg interactions as well. And because our arrays are made by spatial light modulators, we can make a number of arbitrary shapes. For example, here's a rubidium hex dressed hexagonal lattice. Here's a bipartite honeycomb. And here are two famous Chicago landmarks, uh, the Sears Tower and the Bean. Um, but I want to add a very important note here, is that the true quantum creator uh, for this is uh, Sharda Anand, who actually drew this by hand, took the Fourier transform, and then used that to make the holographic pattern uh, for that array. So now moving on to the next part of my talk, uh, which is mid-circuit uh, measurements, or rather mid-circuit operations. So in this part of my talk, I want to talk about how we can use mid-circuit measurements on one of the elements, on one of the elements to perform feedback operations on the other. Uh, using a type of protocol called a spectator qubit protocol. So I'll explain what that is. So here, let's imagine we have our rubidium atoms, um, and they're sitting there in a quantum superposition, but they're slowly accruing phase or, or a noise-induced phase from the environment. This could be from stray electric fields, stray magnetic fields, or, or whatever it may be. So the idea is we want to correct this. 
So one uh, or a, a set of protocols that do this are called spectator pro protocols, where we now have a different set or a subset of, uh, of, of spectator qubits that also sample this noise, also absorb uh, like uh, in, are the noise induces a um, a phase on the spectator qubits that's correlated with the, the data qubits. And then what we can do is we can do a mid-circuit measurement on the spectator qubits that also sampled this noise, use that to infer the phase that our data qubits got, and then correct it in real time. So this is the idea behind spectator qubits. But there are two very important requirements to be able to do this, kind of, this type of uh, corrective uh, procedure. One, you need to be able to perform a high fidelity mid-circuit measurement in your processor. And secondly, you need to be able to perform a feedback operation that's faster than any kind of decoherence in your system. Uh, but now I'm going to argue that we have both uh, in our atom array. So, so this, is, uh, this is our system. Um, so now our qubits are going to be defined in the hyperfine ground states. Uh, so those are the zeros and ones. Um, for rubidium, it's a uh, 6.8 gigahertz transition. For cesium, it's 9.2. And uh, this is, these are the Rabi oscillations uh, for those qubits. And the way we read them out is with uh, the D2 lines uh, on the atoms. Uh, so that's 780 and 852. And importantly, these uh, wavelengths are really far away from each other. So we have independent control and readout. Uh, but to convince you of that, uh, what we first do is a dynamical decoupling sequence on the rubidium atoms. This is a technical thing for measuring the coherence time. Um, but we can measure the coherence time of the, of the rubidium atoms, and we measure around uh, 650 milliseconds. Um, then what we can do is uh, also decouple our cesium atoms, but importantly this time, we're going to perform a mid-circuit measurement on the cesium atoms while, cake, uh, while we're doing this uh, circuit on the rubidium atoms. And what we find is that the coherence of our rubidium atoms is unchanged. So what this means is that our rubidium, or our data qubits, stay coherent when our spectator qubits are measured. And that's really important because this means that we can do a mid-circuit measurement on some subset of our qubits. Um, if you work through the math, you'll find that the chance of a bit flip on our rubidium atoms from the 50 milliseconds of cesium readout is uh, 10 to the minus 11, so that's like arbitrarily small for our purposes. So now we've got a good mid-circuit measurement, so now we set out to do a spectator qubit protocol. So what we did is that we controllably injected magnetic field noise into our processor so that we could uh, controllably understand what's going on here. Um, so importantly, the magnetic field noise that we inject has a random phase. So on any given shot of the experiment, we don't know what it is, so we can't correct for it in post-processing because we don't know what it was. Um, so what we find is that we can completely decohere our rubidium qubits this way. So then we introduce our cesium qubits. We let them also sample the same noise. We measure it on every given shot of the experiment, and then we use that measurement to infer what phase the rubidium atoms accrued, and then we correct that on the, uh, uh, on the rubidium atoms. And what we find is that we can completely, or we can recover the coherence uh, of the rubidium atoms. And so importantly, this means that feed forward corrects for correlated phase errors on our data qubits. And so this, uh, this methodology is broadly applicable to all quantum computing uh, platforms. Um, so if you want to read more about it, it's, uh, you can find it in our paper there. So now I want to talk about the last bit, which is the generating interactions uh, in this array. So the way uh, we generate interactions uh, in neutral atom platforms is typically using a phenomenon known as a Birber blockade. So we people, there have been quite a few talks about, about this already, but I'll just explain it again. Uh, but imagine you have two atoms, and they're really close to each other, and you try to promote both of them to a, uh, to a, to a Rydberg state then the interactions between them can be so strong that they shift uh, the pair state out of resonance with the lasers, and you share a single Rydberg excitation among the two, and this naturally creates a, an entangled state. And importantly, the Rydberg blockade is the fundamental building block that we use for generating or creating two qubit gates in these systems. And so uh, you already heard a lot of awesome work today, um, but people from all around the world have now used this phenomena to generate uh, entanglement operations uh, with fidelities now greater than 99%. Um, but importantly, I want to argue that using a two-species arch architecture, you can uh, find a lot of cool new ways. Uh, and you have a lot of uh, cool control knobs that can, you can really use to engineer entanglement generation in these systems. So for rubidium and cesium, um, same things apply. If you uh, excite them to high principal quantum numbers, you'll get like a gigahertz interaction over several microns. So for example, let's say we excited both rubidium and cesium to principal quantum number 68. Then you should roughly expect that the rubidium-cesium interaction is about the same order of magnitude as rubidium, rubidium, same order of magnitude as cesium uh, to cesium. But importantly, there are situations where the Rydberg uh, pair that you excite to is really close in resonance to another pair. 
That situation is called a Forster resonance. And when you have that, uh, that situation, you actually end up recovering the, one, the, the natural 1 over r cube scaling of the electric dipole-dipole interaction. And so uh, coincidentally, uh, a place where that happens is actually if you go one end down on cesium. So 68, 67 is an example of this, where now the, actually there should be a purple line there, but I guess it didn't show on these proper points. But you can imagine that there is a stronger purple line there uh, that's about an order of magnitude stronger at 10 microns and so strong that it's actually probably even off this, off this chart. But no, it's just right there. Um, so the, the cool thing about that is that uh, the cool, cool, a lot of cool applications, but probably the, the biggest things is that it allows you to do, uh, create, gives you an asymmetric interaction between rubidium and cesium that you can use for generating me mediated multi-cubic gates and also for doing high weight stabilizer measurements. So then we set out to investigate this. So uh, we set up uh, pairs of atoms and the way we um, excite the atoms to these Rydberg states is uh, we use a two photon process where we send infrared light in from one side, uh, blue light in from the other side. Uh, to excite the atoms uh, to, these, uh, to, these, uh, to these states. Um, so there's a lot of uh, information here, but I wanna call your attention to two manifolds of states. We have what's called hyperfine qubits, so this is when the zero and one are encoded in our hyperfine ground states. And then we also have what are called the ground Rydberg qubits. This is where our zero and one are encoded in the upper hyperfine level and in the Rydberg state. So we first look at the ground Rydberg qubits, and what we find um, is let's say we drive that transition, then we can see a nice coherent Rabi oscillation on our cesium atoms. Um, and then we can drive our rubidium atoms, we also see a nice Rabi oscillation. And then we can investigate now the Rydberg blockade um, for this Forster resonance. And what we do for that is we first do a pi pulse on the cesium atoms, so they're all sitting up in the Rydberg state, and then we attempt to drive the rubidium atoms, and we see the following which is that their uh, Rabi oscillation is suppressed. And so importantly, this is the first demonstration of an inter-element Rydberg blockade. Um, so we're quite excited about that. And so armed with that um, very cool phenomena, we were like, oh, can we now generate entanglement between in the hyperfine uh, manifold of states? So that's now uh, this data. So this is now an entangling operation. And for this, we use what's called the pi to pi pi protocol. Um, but uh, I don't have time to go into uh, how that works. But the idea is, depending on whether or not your cesium atom is in a Rydberg state or not, your uh, rubidium atom will get a pi phase shift or not. Um, and so that's how we can do what's called a CZ uh, interaction or a CZ gate. And so from, uh, from the results of such a sequence, you'll find that if our cesium, uh, cesium atom is measured to be in the upper hyperfine level, this is what the rubidium phase looks like. And then if you measure the, ce the cesium atom in the other level, you'll see that the rubidium atom has undergone a pi phase shift. And so probably this is a, a controlled Z interaction, um, which is how we generate correlations between rubidium and cesium. And with that, I, I wanna say that we really have a really scalable quantum information platform for doing uh, uh, multi-cubic control, for error correction and surface codes, for demonstrating quantum advantage, and also for doing QRAM. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all the wonderful members of, of the Dual Species Array Lab and you for your time. Thank you. So thanks, Kevin. Uh, questions? Okay, maybe I'll start off with one. So uh, would there be an advantage to doing this with some of the alpha and earth qubits that seem to be have other advantages? Uh, yeah, uh, there, there certainly, I feel there's a lot of, uh, of what I like to say, many different complementary and compelling approaches to building neutral atom systems. Um, alkaline earth uh, atoms have the advantage to, of uh, having like these really long-lived um, hyper, like uh, ground states. Um, so that's, 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 a, that's a, a really nice feature to have. Um, but then the complexity of your experiment grows quite large. Now you have to you know, cool and trap an alkaline earth atom in addition to an alkali atom. So that's quite, that's quite complicated. So it depends on what the goal of your experiment would be. If you're interested more in doing like uh, measurements and uh, quantum feedback and demonstrating some of the early science there, it's probably better to stick with like uh, two alkalis, which are a little bit more straightforward to cool uh, and trap, which is kind of the, the main focus of, of this experiment. Okay. There's certainly advantages with also having an alkaline earth, but it becomes harder in other aspects. Yeah, Kate. Um, so during your experiments with mid-circuit measurement, uh, was there a particular reason why y'all chose to use XY8 as your DD sequence? Uh, 
Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, we just did uh, um, experiments with increasing number of decoupling pulses until we found that there wasn't really an advantage to using uh, so many more. So that was kind of the main. So we started with XY4 and then XY, XY and then 16. And then we're like, okay, the advantage from that isn't worth all the number of pulses that we have to do. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Okay, one more question. Yes. I have a question from our virtual audience. Uh, is there a limit to how many species can be used? Uh, that's, yeah, uh, I, I, no, I guess, yeah. Depend <laughs> yeah. There's a limit to how much money you're willing to put in the system, I guess. Well, I guess there's a limit to how many like laser cool laser trappable atoms there are on the periodic table. So I guess that's like 20 different elements, yeah, that are reasonable. Okay, uh, well, let's thank Kevin again for a great talk. All right, um, so I'll go ahead and welcome up our next speaker. We have Nat Tana Vescardin. I'm sorry, welcome. Hi, and uh, thank you for the opportunity for uh, inviting me to be here and for uh, uh, honoring me with this prize. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some work I'm very excited about where we prepared non-abelian topological order um, from wave function collapse on a trap ion quantum processor. So to start off, let me, I might need to explain some of these words first. And in particular, I want to explain what, uh, why and how we're doing this. So first of all, what is a non-abelian topological phase? Um, so a non-abelian topological phase are phases of matter that exhibit excitations called non-abelian anions. Now, what is an anion? Um, to step back first, uh, we, let me just uh, mention what abelian anions are. So you can have two anions, A and B, and you can think of it as taking two of these particles, moving one around the other, and you sort of accrue something that's like an aeronobohm phase in a way that generalizes what a boson or a fermion is. So you might accrue some phase E to the I alpha, and if you think of it as a process in time, you can think of that as um, creating two particles, linking them together, and that gives you some phase factor. Now, for non-abelian statistics, you can imagine these particles have some uh, sort of uh, uh, degenerate manifold of states inside in which, uh, uh, in addition to obtaining a phase, you might, get to, you might get something more exotic, such as a unitary operator acting in that degenerate subspace. And what might happen is that for non-abelian anions, suppose you create two pairs and then wind one around the other. When you fuse the two back, you might have made uh, some action on that space such that when you fuse back, you don't fuse back to the vacuum. You fuse into some third anion C. And that's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's the type of excitation we're looking to create. Now, um, why do we want to realize non-abelian phase? Well, the zeroth order, is, it's cool. It hasn't been realized before. At infinite order, it, it is one route to perform universal fault-tolerant quantum computation, but that's uh, a goal, a distant goal. But uh, just from like a condensed matter perspective, um, it's already been very hard to probe and verify in an actual solid state or condensed matter system that we have non-abelian anions. So ever since the, the uh, discovery of the first topological phase, the fractional quantum Hall effect 40 years ago, um, and for example, we have some candidates for uh, non-abelian topological phase, such as this nu equals 5 halves fractional quantum Hall effect. That was already 20 years ago. And till now, we don't have any decisive evidence that non-abelian anions can exist. So how are we going to do that? Um, uh, the, this brings me to the topic of engineered quantum matter, where uh, there has been very recent exciting progress of instead of uh, trying to look for a condensed matter system that has these uh, anions to sort of make one ourselves in the lab. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, two teams, one from Harvard and one from Google, they uh, showed us how to make the simplest uh, abelian topological order, the so-called the Z2 spin liquid or the Z2 tor coat. Um, and what these two groups did was uh, the Harvard group did, uh, took uh, a bunch of rid uh, Rydberg atoms put them in an array such that their ground state realizes the Z2 spin liquid. 
And on the other hand, the Google team created the surface code. And they use a unitary circuit in superconducting qubits to create, uh, to uh, evolve with some gates and show that you get this Z2 surface code. But um, there's actually a restriction to what these two teams were doing. So from the Harvard team, you can imagine starting with the trivial state and evolving adiabatically into another phase. And you can imagine that if you want to tune adiabatically, the time that takes to prepare that will scale with the system size. Also on uh, a quantum circuit, you can imagine using some unitary, but you can use some sort of lieb robinson bounds to argue that a linear depth circuit is required. So if you go to a larger chip, um, the, the time that it takes or the depth of the circuit will scale with the system size. But this is only if you use unitary, and there's a cheat which, which we uh, can actually use. And what uh, Kevin was talking about just a while ago is to use measurements. And in fact, um, there's a cheat. This cheat was known like 20 years ago on how to prepare the Tor code quickly if you use measurements. So the idea is the following. Let us start with the product state. And I, uh, here I, put, I have red and blue qubits. And let me just put them on the vertices and edges of this, uh, of this uh, square lattice. They're initialized in the plus state. And I want to prepare the Tor code state, which is a state where it's stabilized by uh, a vertex term of four z, four blue z's uh, for every vertex, and the plaquette term, which is four x's around every plaquette. So what do we do? We start with this product state, and we measure this five body operator, uh, x, a red x in the middle, and four z's around it. And this is a non-unitary process. Uh, depending on the measurement outcome, um, you're going to get a classical value, which I denoted small x at the middle of each, uh, each vertex. And uh, the measurement outcome is random, but we know that depending on the measurement outcome, uh, we can always uh, fix it to get the desired outcome we want. And the way that works is we record the measurement outcome depending on whether you get plus or minus. And when you get, whenever you see a minus, that uh, you just apply some x operators connecting the two minuses, and that will restore you uh, the desired Tor code state. So this is a cheat that allows you to pre prepare um, uh, uh, stabilizer states. That is, for any uh, product of poly operators, you just need to re uh, measure those operators. And you can qu quickly prepare a state that has uh, those operators with eigenvalue uh, plus 1. OK. So uh, uh, when going back a bit, um, what I did was I measured that five-body operator. And you can think of it as practically what you do is you want to measure this four-body operator with the, all the blue z's. You couple it to an ancilla on the red side, and then you measure that x. Now I wanted to actually flip this around. Uh, I was saying that uh, quantum information people will view the red side as an ancilla. But actually, uh, what I'm proposing and what we realize is we should not think of it as an ancilla. We should think of it as a charge in the sense that this five-body operator, you should actually think of it as a Gauss law. So if you think of, if you look at this operator, it looks a lot like a divergence of E, where the Z uh, are the electric fields, and the X in the middle is the charge. So this is sort of a, uh, a mod 2 version of uh, electromagnetism that we usually see uh, when we learn it. But the idea is when we perform some, this process so-called gauging, what we can do is project into some gauge invariant south space where the Gauss law holds. Uh, now, we cannot perform projection in uh, experiment, but we can perform measurement. But the measurement outcome is random, but we can still fix uh, the outcome to be the one we want. So by flipping this picture around, instead of starting with an ancilla of red sites in a product state, we can consider starting with some other state that might be interesting. And by going to perform this gauging process, we might obtain a gauge theory of that uh, wave function, which might have uh, interesting structures. And uh, the, the idea of this picture is starting from a short range entangled state, if you perform this uh, five body operating measurement, which performs this so-called gauging, the output will always be long range and tangle and is a state that is hard to prepare only with unitary. OK, so armed with this insight, we can move beyond now just preparing stabilizer states. So by preparing stabilizer states, you can think of it as the red sites being in a paramagnetic state. Um, I perform this five body measurement to perform this gauging. And now the Tor code, you can think of it as a deconfined phase of a Z2 gauge theory. That's usually how condensed matter people and high energy people think about the Tor code. But now, moving beyond stabilizer states, using this insight, we can actually prepare 
states that are not uh, written simply as a product of poly operators. For example, the state we're going to prepare that I'm going to show you has non-abelian anions, and it comes from gauging a so-called uh, symmetry-protected topological state. Okay. So what uh, you can do in the experiment is uh, earlier this year we showed how to do this uh, measurement and feed for it explicitly for the Toric code. Uh, the technology has just recently caught up, even though it was known for a long time how to do that. Uh, but we wanted to move forward uh, beyond that, and what we did is we prepared this non-abelian topological order, which has a, a gauge group, which is this D4 group, the symmetries of the square. So we move beyond a Z2, which is 0 or 1, to a non-abelian group, D4. Okay. So let me just explain a bit what the platform we use. This is Continuum's H2 trap ion processor that just came out in May. And it has 32 fully connected qubits. And uh, the, the specs are there, but just to point out that they have fully connected qubits, they have very good uh, single and two qubit fidelities. The, the preparation circuit is quite simple. Uh, the idea is I'm first going to prepare the so-called symmetry protected topological state. This is some sort of jargon, but if, you can, if you're a condensed matter person, you can think of it as some cousin of the topological insulator. And if you are a quantum information person, this state is basically some hypergraph state, which is some beefed up version of the cluster state. So we prepare this uh, SPT phase, and that's obtained by some ZZZ rotation on all uh, uh, qubits. Then we perform this measurement which projects us into this Gauss law, and that is obtained by further applying this cluster state, measuring, and depending on the measurement outcome, uh, perform a feed-forward correction. Um, how to describe the state we've got, um, you can describe it with a sort of non-stabilizer state. So uh, what I'm showing up here is we have in the final model 27 qubits, and because of the all to all connectivity, we can simulate uh, them living on a torus. Um, you can describe them by these so-called stabilizers, but they're no longer poly operators. So you can see that instead of something that looks like a toric code with a product of x's and product of z's, the star operator now has some x's, but also these control z operators. So you can think of it as the final state is as if we have three toric codes, one labeled for red, green, and blue, but they're coupled in an intricate way such that um, the final product has non-abelian anions. Um, so after we've uh, prepared this state, we want to check that these operators have eigenvalue plus one, so we go ahead and measure them, and the output is that of all of these are in the 90% uh, range. And that allows us to bound the fidelity of the state to about 70%, and per site, that is about 98.4%. What else can we uh, confirm uh, that we prepare this non-abelian state uh, um, uh, other than just preparing the state? Um, there are four other experiments we performed, such as, uh, unlike the Torah code, you can actually have a single anion on the torus for non-abelian states. Um, you can also prepare these 22 different states for which all these star and plaquette operators are, uh, uh, are plus one. And this 22 is sort of weird because for an, any abelian state, that number must be a square, but uh, the reason you get this 22 is because actually uh, closely related to this reason you get a single anion on torus. We also did the uh, experiment where I showed in the beginning where you create two of these anions, braid one around the other, and then fuse them back. You don't get back to the vacuum. The one I really want to talk about is this intrinsically non-abelian braiding, which involves three non-abelian anions. So let me explain that a bit. In some sense, these uh, non-abelian anions, they in colloquially, they have a PhD in knot theory. They sort of know what type of knots or links you're using to braid them. So if we go back to the Torah code, which has abelian anions, uh, if uh, they will, you only get a minus sign if you link E with M in space time. So you can imagine E and M, if they were unlinked, you would see a phase of plus one. When you link them, you get a minus one. But consider this, uh, this link I'm showing you here with three colors. You can notice that if I remove the green one, then the red and blue are not linked. But together, this link uh, is inseparable. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, uh, disentangle them. So uh, if any of these anions that you use in this braiding process were abelian, you would have seen a phase of plus one, which means that if we saw a minus one, it means that all these anions must have been non-abelian. And indeed, we confirmed that and experimentally, 
uh, we did, you can convince yourself that the thing on the right is topologically equivalent to the thing on the left. And uh, you expect a phase of minus one and the experiment, we find something very close to e to the i pi. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, I've shown how to prepare the Tor code efficiently and how to move beyond the Tor code to prepare non-abelian topological order uh, given by this group D4. So what's next? Um, uh, our theoretical work actually shows that if we now think of phase of matter on the equivalence of allowing measurements, then it actually gives a new equivalence uh, class where many of these phases of matter become now easy to prepare. Uh, what's exciting or interesting is that some of these uh, phases of matter are actually universal for topological quantum computation, but they are too still, our, our theory uh, suggests that they're actually still too hard to be prepared by uh, circuits and measurements. For example, uh, Fibonacci anions is one example, but another cool one is uh, a gauge theory given by the gauge group where you permute five elements, uh, and S5. And if you've ever heard of this fun fact that the quintic polynomial has no solutions in terms of radicals, that five is the same five as this uh, five that appears here. So there's some deep connection to mathematics that we want to explore further. But looking at the near term, actually they are all, there are already uh, 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 topological orders which can be still be universal by, uh, for, by braiding and also uh, if you have extra measurement. And that might be interesting to do next. And the easiest one to do is the symmetry of the triangle instead of the symmetry of the square. And our theoretical work shows that surprisingly, any of those needs at least two rounds of measurements. Okay, and uh, more on the theory side that could be explored is how to do error correction because I just prepared a state. Uh, it would be interesting to figure out how to do active error correction in these models which are uh, less explore explicitly on the lattice model. Okay, so let me just quickly thank my collaborators, uh, which was done, uh, this work was done with my uh, PhD advisor, Ashvin Mishana, and uh, postdocs at Harvard, Ryan Thorngren and Ruben Verizon. Ruben will be moving here as a uh, faculty soon. And uh, I just want to thank the collaboration with Continuum, and especially shout out to Mosi Iqbal and Henrik Dreyer. Thank you. All right, so we'll go ahead and open up for questions. Yes. So for these plots here, so normally when you do these measurement enabled long range entanglement, you still get sort of area law in terms of the amount of entanglement entropy in the systems. Um, is that the case that when you do like more measurements here, can I think about it as building up more entanglement entropy in the system, or is it still some low entanglement entropy state that's sort of being prepared? Uh, the state will have topological entanglement entropy, yeah, but everything is still area law if you do finite uh, rounds of measurements and unitaries. Every, everything is still area law in here. So the surprise is that even with measurement, certain states we think that are area law still cannot be prepared efficiently with uh, unitaries and measurements. And maybe just to follow up on that, can I, you know, there's somehow a, a discrete thing here between like S3, S4, and then S5, which I guess has mm -hmm. to do with the Galois connection. Yes. But yes. should it be that if I now go to S6, X7, mm -hmm. is it that they always take the same number of measurements? Or as you go to sort of higher order, does it take more and more measurements? Oh, oh. so S4? for S5, the claim is that a known finite number of measurements can prepare it. And S6 will also be in its own box, S7 another box, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? I've got one really quickly. Um, so you mapped your Torque code to the H2 Quantinium processor. Uh, is there any, like, what was the, the natural choice for you to, to map to that physical um, qubit implementation? Uh, for the Torque code? Yes. Yeah, so I guess uh, their they're all-to-all connectivity allowed us to actually put it on a torus rather than having to do a surface code implementation. So that, that was one thing you could do with their device that you couldn't do otherwise, unless you have long range interactions. Okay, yeah. very nice, very nice. All right, any more questions? All right, well, we'll go ahead and thank our speaker once again. Thank you. Uh, 
I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Zinghan Guo. Uh, Zinghan is a PhD student in Alex High's lab uh, here at the School of Molecular Engineering. Uh, so I'll leave it to you, Zinghan. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Xinhan from uh, High Lab, the University of Chicago. And today it's a great honor to present my work in this uh, Boeing Quantum Creators Prize Symposium. And today I will talk about our um, diamond membrane platforms for quantum technologies. Yeah, so today there are, uh, there are a number of physical platforms for quantum technologies, and that color centers in diamond is one of the prime candidates. Um, so there are major, two major players. One is the nitrogen vacancy centers, we call them centers in diamond. And the second one is the group four centers, including silicon vacancy, germanium vacancy, team vacancy centers. So um, there have been a lot of landmark demonstrations of quantum technologies based on those two centers. For instance, MA centers have been used for quantum sensing applications, nanoscale MR spectroscopy, um, some quantum networking demonstrations, and even quantum computing. And group four centers at this moment are mostly used for quantum networking applications, but people are still actively exploring um, that, the, the more applications of, the, of them. So, um, so the future development of this um, color centers for quantum technology actually hugely depends on how you can integrate color centers of, uh, in diamond with other materials, platforms, or devices. So we have seen a number of great achievements recently. For example, um, people from uh, Harvard have integrated group four centers with uh, frequency modulations and wavelength conversion to achieve um, telecom band quantum networking with quantum memory. And MA centers in diamond has also been um, integrated with microfluidic channels for quantum biosensing applications. And by fabricating some very delicate small structures on top of diamond, you can, you can also get some uh, phenonic crystals so that uh, you can engineer uh, the phenonic interaction with color centers, uh, which could open up some novel uh, interaction or um, coupling regimes. So um, despite, despite the recent progress, we have to be aware of the fact that actually material integration and engineering of diamond is quite challenging. So as you may know, um, growing diamond, especially single crystal diamond on top of other materials is a very tricky task. Otherwise, you would see a lot of demonstrations these days for like uh, diamond-based microelectronics or even like jewelries for fashion. But the fact is that you don't see them because the heterogeneous growth is very hard. And also, diamond is a very hard material and uh, chemically inert which brings to a non-trivial nanofabrication processes. Um, and uh, third, the quantum grade diamond, like the di diamond that used for quantum applications, are normally tiny, extremely expensive, with very low, with very, very, very limited supply. So that could eventually limit the applications of the diamond-based technologies for industry, industrial or commercial applications. And his best buddy, which is nano diamond, on the other hand, is quite affordable and uh, um, is quite common. But uh, they suffer from uh, a lot of randomness, including locations, orientations, which um, brings to a low device yield. And most importantly, that gives you a um, that have a poor cubic coherence. So it's something that you don't like for the for the quantum applications. So we might, you know, standing between the 0D and 3D diamond, we might think of, uh, we might hope for if there is an intermediate form of diamond that uh, we can work with to overcome these challenges and to combine the advantages of the two uh, state-of-the-art platforms. So before coming to the real um, realization, let's make a wish list first say, what do we want from such a material platform? And I categorize them into two different uh, groups. 
So the first group, um, we, I call it first order, hopes, is directly uh, coming from the last slide. It's a very straightforward way of thinking this uh, platform is that uh, we hope this platform can protect the cubic coherence inside. But in the meantime, we want to have straightforward in device integration options. But for the second order, we hope to be more creative on this hybrid platform because we hope to achieve novel coupling interaction interfacing regimes based on this platform. And from a um, more like a scalable perspective of you, we wish this diamond to be simply as a flexible functional layer in device heater structures. And the fabrication steps should better be uh, compatible with the current semiconductor industry so that we can embrace more integration options and to cut down the cost. And the figures on the right is a very nice example from MIT showing that you um, certain, certain that they um, integrate some diamond frames with color centers to CMOS chips for photonic uh, modulation. So um, our approach is a little bit different from uh, what have been demonstrated from MIT, is that uh, instead of ha fabricating those very fragile diamond frames and beams, we hope to build a more universal platform, which is more flexible and uh, more robust, um, uh, which is basically the diamond membrane platform that you can do a lot of different uh, things on top, of, on top of it. So the basic idea uh, is like this. We implanted a lot of uh, helium ions into the crystal and induced a phase transition of carbon um, from diamond to graphite at a specific depth. So basically you will end up with a diamond, graphite, and diamond sandwich layer. And then we grow some high quality diamond on top of it, introduce the color centers inside, and uh, prepare some smaller, like 200 micrometer square uh, diamond membranes for um, the device integration. So in general, this is a method that can create large scale flat diamond membranes but compared to other works in a similar fashion, we offer um, we we we, can, we are able to offer double side uh, atomic, atomically smooth surfaces. Uh, we have bulk like crystal quality, and uh, we also introduced uh, isotopic purification during overgrowth, which is very important to uh, improve the cubic coherence, and uh, of course the delta doping capability as well. So. Um, so now we have this uh, diamond membrane, and the uh, next step we will think about is how do we integrate them with other material platforms. So uh, we developed the two different methods. The first is um, using a bonding agent called, uh, a, a photoresist called HSQ, and the second method is direct bonding uh, by surface plasma activation of the interface between uh, integration. So both methods offers um, very high device yield, um, very precise uh, alignment between the wafer and the carrier, between the diamond membrane and the carrier wafer, um, and also a uh, uh, also a flexible wafer choices. But uh, those two uh, methods are a little bit different. Is that HSQ method is better to create a high strain to the um, diamond membrane if you choose the carrier wafer uh, wisely. And direct bonding method instead, they offers a very low background noise, so that can give you a very huge, uh, a very large um, signal contrast, which is good for um, quantum sensing and uh, imaging applications. So uh, specifically, I want to mention this uh, direct bonding method because it is a great example of how diamond can be a functional layer in device heater structures. Uh, so now uh, here we show a 10 nanometer thick of diamond sitting on top of uh, bonded to a uh, sapphire wafer. And as you can see from the TEM image that uh, we have extremely flat and periodic interface uh, between the diamond and sapphire which strongly indicates that we generate a covalent bond uh, in, at the interface. And this membrane is also very flat across the full area. For example, across 200 micrometer, the overall thickness variation is only less than one nanometer, which is actually below the resolution of the tool. 
And the microscope images on the right, you can see the diamond membranes bonded to thermal oxide and a few silica. They sometimes have markers where they even have some prefabricated trenches. So to, to, to show how flexible the wafer can be. And now we have this platform, so we want to know what we can do with it. The first example I will give is the uh, string engineering of the TMIX centers in Diamond. So TMIX center is, belongs to the group of uh, group four centers, which is mostly used for quantum networking applications. So normally, um, the dominant decoherent source of this color center is uh, phonon scattering, basically the mechanical oscillations inside the crystal that will uh, Make, that will uh, give you a decay or and decoherence of the qubit. And plus, in the string-free case, the qubit states of this TMIX center belongs to different orbits, which actually prevents microwave driving. So, um, and all optical driving for this method is, has a pretty low uh, fidelity, so that's why people are getting pretty um, tough time working with this kind of centers. So by introducing string, we basically um, increases the energy splitting between the two levels that links the fauna, so that effectively re we reduce the phonon population at such a level. And as a result, we improve the qubit coherence uh, drastically and therefore the operation temperature as well. So as you can see, right now our, t uh, our T2 stands at above 200 microseconds at 4K, which is about one order of magnitude higher than before. And we, we, all, we can also see that, uh, so, um, so this string profile will induce some orbital mixing between the qubit states that enables a very efficient microwave control. And as you can see, our microwave Rabi is uh, quite fast with a fidelity of over 99% at 1.7K and 97% at uh, 4K. And besides, we are able to see a um, exceptional optical coherence with uh, transform limited optical line widths at uh, even up to 7K, which means that combine all the properties shown above, this um, strained team mix center is a great candidate for the quantum networking applications. The second example I want to give is the uh, MV centers in diamond membrane because this is a very large area uh, for applications in, in this material platform. So by working on the isotopic, isotopic purification during overgrowth, we're able to remove basically the majority of the nuclear spins inside the crystal so that we can improve the qubit coherence. And we can easily get the T2 star of up to hundreds of microseconds at room temperature. By, in, uh, by enforcing this uh, delta doping technique, we're also able to uh, delta dope the 50 nitrogen MV centers into the membrane. And which can be spectrally resolved by uh, ODMR signatures. So this is a powerful tool for quantum sensing, and uh, we have a demonstration of uh, quantum biosensing, which we integrate the membranes with microfluidic channels. And using this device, we're able to measure, we're able to detect the MV centers and sensing targets simultaneously. Uh, using a dual imaging system. This is very useful for the future um, co-localization co studies of the, of the uh, sensing targets. And because our diamond membrane is sub-micrometer, so we are able to enable a back illumination from the backside of this sample, especially we call it a total internal reflection um, mode. Basically, we um, have a incident angle which is larger than the um, refractive index, um, you know, uh, difference, so that we can enable a total internal reflection, and that gives us a huge uh, boost over the signal contrast because we basically reduced the signal background coming from the fluid that's sitting on top of this uh, diamond. The third example I want to give is uh, on-chip photonics. So quantum photonics is actually a core topic for a lot of uh, quantum networking applications and even uh, distributed quantum uh, computing. And uh, it's been a very tough problem for the diamond to be uh, a high quality material for, uh, for cavities. And here we, but you know, by bonding the diamond to a low index material, it is a natural platform to generate high quality photonics. 
and we developed two methods, and both of them showing great uh, quality factors of up to 10K or even beyond. And uh, please stay tuned because we, are able, we will uh, announce our incoming result, which is a drastic improvement of all of this. And finally, I would like to say this is a exciting platform, and we are always being amazed by how, how uh, the endless possibilities it, this platform brings to us. And we are excited to work with uh, different labs and researchers on different directions, such as photonic integration, hybrid quantum systems, and wave based quantum sensing. And uh, finally, I would like to thank our PI Alex High, High Lab, and uh, a lot of different uh, labs that work with us and a uh, number of funding agencies. And we also have Boeing there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned how this technique um, works for a lot of different substrates. Can you comment on what kinds of films um, you can bond? Like, are there constraints on what materials uh, you can work with on the thin film level? What kind of film? Uh, like, yeah, like, uh, could you do things other than diamond with this technique? Things bond? other than diamond. It is possible because in in general, the smart cut method, like this implantation plus um, uh, transfer, is not a method only for diamond. You can see the same thing on, for example, very commercially available SOI wafers, or lithium nitride on silicon. And I think people are definitely thinking about how to apply in this for silicon carbide films on you know, on thermal oxide. So it is a uh, very, very universal method, and we hope this, you know, by, by doing the research, we can also excite other, we can also help other fields of, uh, of this kind of uh, integration to, to evolve. You mentioned being able to demonstrate um, coherence times that were of order of hundreds of uh, microseconds. Do you anticipate that those could be boosted by any sort of optimizations? Like further improvements? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So uh, I, I didn't mention over here because it's really short. That uh, uh, by further string engineering, actually, you, you, you can use an even larger string to even like flatten out this curve to, to get to a very long coherence time. For example, now we have measured in the 1.7K, which is mostly not limited by phone. Now we can easily go up to like five milliseconds. So, um, so by uh, adding more strain into the system, we can flatten out the curve and uh, finally bring this hopefully to the millisecond level. Yeah. Yes. Uh, great talk. Uh, so I wonder what's, uh, the, what's the limit the yield of the diamond membrane? Is it possible to extend to wafer scale, like very large membranes? Oh yeah, that's a great question. And also a lot of people ask. Um, <laughs> so, so, so right now, if, if there's no problem of the equipment, um, our transfer yield about this HSQ-based uh, integration method is about 100%. And uh, the direct bonding method is about 90 to 95 percent, so it's actually quite high. And now the current, mo the major limitation would be the equipment. Uh, there are some uncertainties, and we are uh, sort of thinking about uh, using something like a wafer bonder or a flip trip bonder to sort of um, you know improve the precision of the process to further enhance the yield. Yeah. Yeah, I also wonder whether it's possible to make it larger. Like wait oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it is possible. Uh, for now, the undercut time, like uh, remove, uh, undercut a membrane from the substrate is quite long. And it is possible that you can have a larger film. For example, people have shown that uh, this type of technique, you can basically peel off the whole film from the, from the substrate. So it is possible, you just need to be patient. For example, that guy takes like three times, three days to, to finish the job. And we, right now we are thinking about you know, how to accelerate this. We'll have some automatic uh, screening so that we don't have to be physically sitting there. Yeah. Okay, I had a question actually. So for the system of the uh, diamond sensing integrated with a microfluidic circuit, is there a sort of first killer app you have in mind for 
what you would do with that system? So, um, yeah, we, we only have a proof of, of demonstration that this can work. But ideally, this is used for, for example, if you have some proteins, some molecules that what you want to you want to observe or characterize, you can use this microfluidic channel to inject them into the system and sort of uh, use the functionalized uh, functionalization to bind them to the diamond membrane. And if you can, if you happen to do this localization, for example, you find a MV center that is quite close to your target, always individual level, you are able to use this MV center to detect the signal coming from this specific molecule or protein or actually even cells so that uh, um, to, to sort of monitor its uh, activity or uh, characterize its uh, uh, material properties. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think we'll move on to the next speaker now, but uh, thank you again. Thank you. Yes, and now I'll introduce the next and final speaker of the session, uh, Sebastian Gorgon uh, from University of Cambridge, a PhD student there. So. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about something very different and a little bit more removed from applications, some very early days, but we are very excited about. Um, some of the work that we've done on, on organic radicals and how they could be um, directed towards some quantum applications in the near future. So people have been thinking about how molecules interact with light for a very long time. And the, um, there is a lot of very detailed physics that can be learned from studying these excited state um, diagrams called Jablonski diagrams, and I'll be telling you about how now we have been able to control and, and build a new type of Jablonski diagram in organic materials. So, um, perfect. Um, so, following on from, from um, the talk just now, uh, I don't need to convince you about the many wonders of, of semiconductor color centers. Um, the, the reason why um, this is such a powerful material platform is that the excited state and ground state um, energy diagram sets up a condition where you can optically generate uh, ground state spin polarization. And uh, this is a very powerful um, spin photon interface, um, but uh, the current challenge in the field is, is making it scalable and tunable. So um, if you like this excited state diagram then, and you can do useful things with it, that's great. But if you don't, you're a little bit stuck because it's a vacancy, you can't really change it. So um, it's very appropriate to, to be talking about this in Chicago because this is the place where a lot of the um, foundational work on organometallic analogs of color centers uh, has been done. So this is work from um, David Ashfalon and Dana Friedman's groups where organometallic chromophores have been engineered to mimic uh, a color center. So um, what our um, question was, uh, simply was, can we do this with fully organic molecules? So why, why would you want to care to remove the metal atom? Well, firstly, these metal atoms have huge spin orbit coupling, and that if, can limit the coherence times in, in the limit of, of um, the most optimized structures. And also, um, if you're uh, working with a uh, fully uh, light atom-based platform, potentially um, you will uh, one day have better biocompatibility prospects. So um, I will now hope that there are no chemists in the room because I'm going to insult them by saying that this is all you need to know about organic compounds. So it's essentially like an atom, but with a lot more flexibility about the layout of the, of the orbitals. So um, most organic compounds um, have an even number of electrons. So this is all of your pharmaceuticals, oil, um, whatnot. Um, they have an even number of electrons, which means they're ground state singlets. Um, that is bad news if you're trying to make them into a quantum material because there isn't much that you can do with a spin equals zero. Um, however, if you are clever and you can figure out a way to stabilize a structure with an odd number of electrons, you can engineer this sort of open shell structure where now the ground state is a doublet. So um, this is possible and I'll show you how we can do this. Um, but just briefly, the, coming back to the question of, uh, of designing a, a, an organic analog of a color center, the, the, the dominant strategy in the field has been um, 
in, in, in something called a, a free spin system. So um, the way it works, you start off with an organic chromophore. So this is a typical Jablonski diagram of organic chromophore. PDI is a very good one. Uh, you can see that the quantum yield of photoluminescence, so imagine for 100 molecules that you populate into the excited singlet state, how many of them will emit? 97 of them will emit a photon. So that's a very good quantum yield. And that tells you that this intersystem crossing yield is very poor. So the intersystem crossing is slow because the energy gap is large. Spin orbit coupling is weak, so most of the photons come out. That's great. Now, if you want to engineer a more interesting excited state spin manifold, um, you can attach a stable radical. So this thing called tempo, you can see, has an unpaired electron on the oxygen. Um, and what this has done is now you can see that we have actually split the triplet manifold into two new states. Um, because there is now a strong exchange coupling between the two spins of the triplet and the pendant radical spin. And that is very nice because this um, now strongly exchange coupled quartered state can be generated, which allows you to um, uh, perform some microwave driven manipulations. But you can see that we have completely killed our emission. And that is because we have now opened a spin conserving channel to generate the triplet state. So you can see that now the process from the photo generated state to this 2d0 t1 is spin allowed and it's very fast. So people have been working on this for a long time and there's a lot of structures, but no emission. All of these structures that have been demonstrated to date do not emit because they have a huge energy gap between the optically active and the spin active state. But there is now a different way of doing open shell organic um, electronics. Um, we have realized that there is a, a family of structures um, based on a trittle radical, so this TTM black unit on the left, which um, have pretty good photoluminescence properties. So they operate completely in the doublet manifold. You can see that there's a very nice symmetry between the ground and excited state. There is no dark state in the excited states that compete with emission, and these structures make fantastic red OLEDs, organic light emitting diodes. So this is where I um, started out playing with their spin when I joined the group is um, looking at how we're in intermolecular systems, um, these radicals can harvest triplets from nearby closed shell molecules. So typically, when you make an OLED, you have to disperse the radicals. They don't like being too close together. They start interacting. They start quenching each other. Not good. So we have to put them in some host. All the hosts that are well known in OLEDs are closed shell. So if there is a way to harvest these triplets, that's fantastic because that will boost your efficiency. And you can already see a flavor here that we have, with, with organic materials, we have an extreme amount of tunability about our excited state energetics. And that is actually very powerful. And some of these signatures have allowed us to notice that actually um, these triplet radical interactions governed by exchange coupling are already very important in intermolecular structures. You can see that there are some processes that happen very efficiently, a lot more efficiently than you'd expect if you were dealing with fully um, decoupled triplets and doublets. So um, we actually see signatures of these exchange coupled um, spin out half and spin three half systems already in the intermolecular case, which inspired us to try looking at, at covalent systems. So this is the material platform that I will spend the rest of my talk describing, so I'll just introduce it to you um, a little bit slowly. So this is now starting out with a luminescent radical, so very similar to the structure I I uh, was describing earlier, but now we take a uh, fruit fly of the organic electronics world. This is actually the first thing that people in the um, 80s made into a, a, an emissive uh, system by applying 400 volts of electricity, anthracene, so it's a very well-known material. We choose it because it has this very um, uh, lucky energy level of the triplet, which you can see sits exactly in resonance with our excited state doublet. And you will see that this energetic resonance has profound consequences to how the excited state Jablonski diagram of these systems looks like. So um, I'll explain to you a little bit about how we know that the Jablonski diagram that I'm going to show you shortly is true. Um, we have many different lines of attack to interrogate what the exciton in these systems is doing. One of them is ultra-fast femtosecond pump probe optical spectroscopy, and that allows us to see that as soon as we um, as this material exci is exci photoexcited, so we generate this excited doublet state, it rapidly delocalizes onto the anthracene and, and generates the triplet. But surprisingly, these materials are still luminescent. So compared to the radical without the anthracene, um, we are preserving three quarters of the emission yield, which is very, very good. 
Um, and if you already look at the uh, diagram on the right, you can see that this maths doesn't add up. So the thing that is actually happening is that after we generate the triplet, much later than in a radical, this emissive D1 exciton can be reformed. And we can see this, uh, there is only one emissive state from the luminescence line shape and um, from the emission dynamics we know that this process is actually temperature activated. Um, so optical spectroscopy is great, but it doesn't give us enough energetic resolution to actually see what's going on in these systems. So we do electron spin resonance, which allows us to directly probe the spin multiplicity of the system, excited state exciton that we're dealing with. And that confirms that we have strongly exchange coupled triplets and radicals because we see signatures of a quartet state in the ESR. So this is actually the situation that we're dealing with. The original um, approach of um, free spin organic systems on the left, and in our case we have this new D1S0 optically active state, which um, is in very close energetic proximity to these two exchange coupled D0 T1 states, which allows us in these systems for the first time to open an optical readout channel and luminescence because we can optically prepare a quartet state, manipulate it with microwaves, but then it's sufficiently close by lying energetically to the optically active state that we can go back, reform it, and emit visible light. So um, we are very excited about this system because it has some uh, very nice properties. For example, we can do all of this at room temperature. So this is room temperature electron spin resonance showing the same lines, shapes that I was showing you earlier at cryogenic temperatures, showing that we have a high yield of spin polarized excited state quartets in dilute films even at room temperature. Um, we can uh, do microwave induced Rabi oscillations, uh, proving that we can pr put this um, quartet state into an arbitrary superposition. And the, um, the, the key thing here is that we are actually not losing any quantum fidelity by introducing the luminescence channel. So uh, compared to the best uh, non-luminescent quarter structures, the fidelities are, are quite uh, similar. And we can do um, pulse electron spin resonance at room temperature as well in these systems because the coherence times are sufficient for that. And very excitingly, we have for the first time demonstrated optical readout via ODMR that we did in collaboration with um, Vladimir Diakonov's group in Würzburg in Germany, as well as the readout at, at room temperature. So um, coming back to the, to the big advantage of, of, of chemistry here, um, we have demonstrated that this molecule has this Jablonski diagram, but the whole pitch was that we can change it if we don't like it. So what we can do, we can stick another radical on the other side of the anthracene, and then we generate an, uh, a larger four spin system, now with an um, excited quintet state, so um, beyond going to higher spin multiplicities, which could be one day more useful for dense architectures in quantum computation, the nice thing here is that this uh, introduces a much more rich uh, manifold of exchange couplings. So now you can see that in the states on the left side, we have very weak exchange because the two radical spins are very far away from each other, 2.1 nanometers. So the exchange is weak on the order of micro EV. But as soon as we generate a triplet on the anthracene bridge that strongly couples both to both of the pendant radicals, the exchange increases by three orders of magnitude. And we see quite interesting signatures of this in the dynamics. So if you look at the comparison between the room temperature electron spin resonance of the monoradical on the left and the biradical on the right, you can see that at early times, they both look comparable. This is actually signatures of these uh, strongly exchange coupled high spin states, quartet for the monoradical, quintet for the biradical. Um, but you can see as you go to later and later times, at 30 microseconds, the monoradical doesn't show any EPR signal. Under the same conditions, you have this very narrow signal near G equals two. So we are quite intrigued by this. And, and you can actually uh, verify that this is coming from a ground state polarization because um, the signal on the right you can see is um, monitored at a pos field position which is away from the central resonance. So this can only be populated um, with a quartet or quintet state in this case. You can see by 10 microseconds it's all decayed. But only for the biradical, the, on the plot on the left, you can see that you have a long lived um, spin polarization, which actually decays with the same uh, lifetime as the T1 time of the ground state radical. So this actually comes about from the fact that the triplet channel in this mechanism is more favorable on emission to the singlet channel. So you can optically generate, now without any microwave driving, a spin polarized ground state. 
So this is uh, the closest um, analog to an MD center that we have so far in organics. So in summary, I have, I have shown you that um, by utilizing an organic luminescent radical, which has been um, engineered to be resonantly coupled to a resonant triplet reservoir, we can bridge the gap between this um, optically active, so luminescent excited state and the state that we're interested in for microwave manipulations. And this way we were able to demonstrate for the first time optical readout in, in organic materials and ground state spin polarization. So with that, um, I would like to thank uh, my supervisor, Richard French, and mentor Emrys Evans for allowing me to, to play around with these radicals, all of the people involved with this work, and you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Could you, this might be a naive question, but can you sort of clarify where I should think about the, the spin sort of living in this D0 or D0, D0 to D1 transition? Like, is it some delocalized excitation? Like, where is the exciton? Okay, yeah, the that's, a, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. So you can see uh, in the ground state, the spin is quite localized. It's sitting sort of pretty much on that carbon where the dot is. That's also the reason why these radicals are stable in the first place, because actually, it's quite isolated from the environment. These phenol rings with the chlorines actually extend above the plane of the PZ orbital where it sits, which isolates it from the environment. Uh, the reason these are luminescent, part of the reason they are luminescent is that the excited state is not sitting on that carbon. It's actually a delocalized exciton where the hole lives on this carbazol, the nitrogen bearing unit, and the electron sits on the central carbon. So, but that is, that is true for, for all of these radicals, even the ones without the the anthracene. So all of these D1 luminescent radicals have this excited state. Okay, not a super well-defined question, but I used to work on color centers before, and so this is super cool to look at. Um, do you have, what is the, is there, are there any rules of thumb or intuitions as to how you go about choosing these molecules and the host materials? There's a zoo of these, I imagine. Like, yes. What, how, what is that process like? Right, that's a good question. So um, that's, I, I was pitching it as a strength, but it can also be a pitfall because you know, you, you are, we are a little bit too spoiled for choice sometimes. Um, we are actually the, the set of, we are, the, the main constraint comes from the luminescent radicals. So, so in, in this work, um, the, the amount of structures that have this um, stable open shell um, structure and luminescence is actually quite small. And this is quite a recent set of um, chemistry that has been shown, maybe five, six years. So that restricts us because we know that we have to be in, in resonance with the energetics of, of that state to do energy transfer, exchange coupling, all, all these things. So then you basically select your luminescent channel, sort of one half of the molecule, or one of the two molecules in your intermolecular system, and then you just go to the library of known materials and you pick which one matches the properties. But then if you, for example, want to build an organic light emitting diode out of this, then you have to worry also about you know, charge transport properties, resistance losses, all, all these sort of things. So quite a big parameter space. Yes, other questions? So I have a question. Um, super cool work. So you sort of have things separated here. There's optical readout and there's optical polarization. Both of those go into the ODMR contrast, which looks to be low. Do you know which one's really limiting you and what those numbers are sort of separated out? Right, that's a, that's a good question. So we are, we are, we are currently working on, on this. The, the optical contrast is very low right now. Um, we think that the, the, basically currently the strategy is to um, so you can see this is sort of a modular mechanism, um, but we haven't really explored deeply the sort of the connectivity between the units. So we think that if we introduce some greater variation in this, we could probably find an experimental answer to which of these two is limiting us. What, to what extent do you think that these spins would ever interact with each other? So within one molecule? They have to interact, otherwise we wouldn't see the signals that we see. So I guess it's then I guess within like separate molecules. Right. So we make sure that they don't interact. So we, we can embed them as in it's, it's quite easy. We you sort of put them in a medium which ensures that they're far away from each other. 
So all of these uh, results are either in very dilute solutions, so in, you know, like an organic equivalent of water, you know, and it's very low concentration, or um, in, a, in a plastic resin, which also had very low doping, so the radical, the molecule to molecule distance is on the order of, you know, 20 nanometers, so they're far enough away that they don't talk to each other. Okay, yes, sure. Thank you for the great talk. Um, could you comment on the prospect of isolating like a single like molecule or spin and also maybe device integration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I probably should have been more explicit about uh, confessing that this is all ensemble measurements. Um, going to, to the single molecule level is, is definitely very exciting. I think there is a lot of um, work that is compatible for us in the sort of world of, of scanning probe microscopy. Um, and single molecule spectroscopy in, in general. Um, currently, the contrasts are low, but as in, if, if you can electrically address the individual molecules on the surface, I think that that should that should work um, quite well. And then, in terms of um, device integration, so the the radicals without all of this um, exchange coupled business, they have been um, successfully integrated into um, electrically driven diodes, as in that was the sort of the main reason we really started looking into them because they, they really can be quite controllable in, in that area. Um, these, um, we haven't tried that with these materials simply because we are sort of starting out with sort of this radical, the red unit is very nice because it doesn't have any dark states and the excited states, that was the main motivation. And now we sort of engineered that in by, <laughs> by design. So um, we don't see sort of the great motivation to make OLEDs out of these materials, but other sorts of devices could be, could be exciting. Okay, maybe one quick question. So uh, you said a lot of these are done in solution. Is mm -hmm. it possible to do this in in the solid state or on a surface? Yep, so yeah. um, all of the, this EPR for example, this is all done in the solid state. So as soon as we go about, because we need to um, immobilize the spins to, 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 to measure them in this technique, so as soon as our solvent melts, we have to go to a solid matrix. So, and all the room temperature EPR is done in the solid. And then the nice thing is that um, we see no difference in the behavior between um, liquid and, and solid media. So provided that the molecules are far away from each other, that they don't talk to each other, the medium doesn't matter. Yeah, great. All right, well, let's thank Sebastian and all the speakers from this session again. And now it's time for our panel discussion. So please, speakers. Thanks once again. These were really, really interesting talks. Um, so I guess we can open up the um, open up the door for some questions. So I'll, I'll start the conversation with just a question to everyone. Um, so all of your talks featured a, experiments on a physical quantum platform. Um, so what challenges would you say for each of your respective platforms would impede scaling of the, the demonstrations that you talked about today? Yeah, I guess I can start. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, lasers are tough to wrangle. Uh, when you're first uh, like setting up an experiment, so uh, often the the main things that are limiting like uh, um, getting uh, like coherent Rydberg interactions between elements is uh, uh, phase noise, amplitude noise um, of your laser system. So every time you get a new like, especially with two species, you need you know a fairly large uh, system of um, of optics and lasers, and so getting all of that to uh, be appropriate and suited for your system uh, uh, is, a, is a is a is a bit of a challenge. I would say that's the primary um, uh, bottleneck, yeah. Yeah, so for um, superconducting qubit or the, the platform, the, the novel architecture I'm working on, it doesn't add on uh, extra complexity in terms of scalability for superconducting qubit. So all the challenges uh, for uh, scaling up uh, for superconducting qubits will also transfer to uh, like this new architecture uh, that we are working on. Uh, so I guess in terms of superconducting qubits in general, uh, I guess probably one of the uh, big limitations is like how many uh, qubits we can 
uh, suit uh, like in, in a fridge and how many control lines uh, we can we can get down there. Uh, there, there have been like very interesting uh, works uh, trying to use, for example, optical uh, pulses uh, to convert to microwave pulses that can give us better uh, scaling perspectives. Um, but I think those are uh, still in early uh, stages. Um, but I guess like once we get beyond that, or even for example, uh, using some of the methods that uh, uh, Sturgeon and others have been pioneering uh, to perform the transduction and linking uh, like different fridges together, uh, that could give us a larger uh, number of uh, superconducting qubits uh, that we can operate. Um, so for my work uh, collaborating with Continuum, I think the main bottleneck is the number of qubits they have. So for example, for their previous version, they only had 20 qubits, which wasn't enough for our purposes. And their new one was 32 qubits, and our final state had 27 qubits. And we had to use some uh, the rest of them as ancillas to do measurements. And uh, we had, even had to do uh, like multiple rounds of measurements. So, so we used ancilla. So we really squeezed every ounce out of that platform to get the result we wanted. Um, so I guess if they had uh, more qubits in the future, that would be um, very cool. But as, as for me, I'm a theorist, so I'm not bound to a particular platform. So for example, this dual species ripper array is also very cool. And, and I, I'm open to see what other uh, platforms that uh, we can use to prepare interesting uh, quantum states. Um, I would say for, for us, um, beyond the, of course, you can tell that we are sort of really just starting out. So um, beyond the, the sort of moving towards um, single molecule, um, we need to boost the ODMR contrast. And, and for that, actually, I think one of the key challenges is um, finding a good theoretical description of these materials. So these open shell um, molecular systems are inherently difficult to, to characterize computationally. So our collaborators have worked very hard on developing new quantum chemical calculation approaches for them, but it's still quite challenging to, to, um, to get to, um, to observables. It would be much better if we could sort of screen them computationally and then ask our chemists to only make a select few, and that is actually common in, in both the luminescent and non-luminescent organic, organic worlds. It's quite difficult to, um, to predict the properties and then um, understand them once you, you, you do the measurements. Yeah, so for our system, I think it's actually the, the seed diamond, which is not the diamond membrane I'm fabricating, but instead the diamond that has been grown in the, in, the, in the safety chamber, that is a major limitation of the scalability. Right now, we are using samples with only three by three millimeter, which we think is sufficient, but a lot of people feel feels like this is far from scal scalable platforms as a three by three millimeter samples. So, uh, so, so yeah, that is definitely the, the bottleneck and the, uh, uh, we are trying to uh, find more like a different material providers who can give us a, a larger seed to start because that's really important to, to really make this uh, platform scalable. Yeah, because as you may know, diamonds are always pretty scarce and small, yeah. Very, very awesome. Um, all right, I'd like to open it up to the audience if you all have any questions for our panel. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, sorry. I think we had a good uh, presentation on architecture, semiconductors, and uh, sorry, superconductors, and finally on the uh, diamond with the biosensing. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is, do you think the type of material that you use in your research influence your result? Uh, this is from the point that there are errors, and errors are key in, in the quantum sector. So do you think that my type of material play a, a role in getting your result? And the second point is, the second question is, uh, what, how are you going to advise the material scientists to help in the design of a very good material in the near future to help realize a good uh, product? Thank you. Maybe I can start. So, um, so diamond itself is actually a very nice material. Um, you can you can do a lot of changes on its material properties. Like you can even control the isotopes, for example. Um, 
So uh, in principle, it should be a, a pretty clean system. So most of the decoherence actually happens at the surfaces or interfaces or side, even sidewalls. By uh, if you don't do the like the edge chain or patterning right, you're gonna introduce a lot of different decoherent sources to it. So uh, so so on the one side, I, and that motivates us to to build a material platform with really high quality crystal. And on the other side, I think we have to be really careful about how do we, how do we treat them, because you can easily bring a lot of different co decoherent sources on the surface. Yeah. So, so it's not only about from the material growth side, how, how do we prepare them, but also on the application side, uh, how do we um, sort of fully utilize the, the qubits properties, but at an, in, in the meantime also protect the coherence from other uh, not very important noises. Yeah. Um, I would say in, in, in our world, sort of we have quite a nice degree of control on the of the local environment because then if if we talk very nicely to our synthetic chemist collaborators they will make a vial of exactly the structure that that we want so you know every single molecule is is already you know made bottom up to be to be the same thinking about how to design that right now is is the big challenge so so in our case we we have a sort of in in this um grid of, of, of non-luminescent molecules that I uh, flashed up. Um, there is, this is from, coming from a very nice review uh, article from this year where the, the key parameter in, in these structures is the exchange coupling between radical and triplet. And the, there is a sort of a family of, of you know, big zoo of, of different approaches of, of, of pairs of these two halves of the molecule linked in, in various ways. And there, there is very little discernible pattern of what linkage gives what type of exchange. And that, I think, is a big bottleneck currently to, to really understand, you know, we don't really know what we will get until we make the molecule and measure it, which slows it down quite a bit. But then on, on the sort of optimization front, we still have a lot of tricks that, that we haven't tried. As in, for example, all, all of the materials uh, that I've been talking about today, then they're full of protons, the, you know, the, their... Uh, that the molecule is full of protons, the medium that it's in is full of protons, so the spin coherence times can be boosted by, by deuterating um, quite easily. Um, I might not be able to address your question directly, but I guess for, for me as a theorist, we're looking for different platforms that can sort of uh, tailor to uh, interesting things we can prepare. Maybe one thing I can mention is, for example, we have another collaboration with IBM where we use their quantum device to prepare a, a, a GHZ state and what we did is they uh, in some of their um, uh, protocols there's some sort of coherent error and we actually intentionally turn on that coherent error and tune through a phase transition so we were able to use their uh, device to our advantage to uh, for example create a phase transition so depending on the platform we can use that um, to uh, suit uh, different purposes of states we want to prepare. Yeah, so I think for solid state uh, devices, material is like one of the most important uh, aspects. Uh, for superconducting uh, qubits uh, in particular, like uh, the, the model we use is actually very important. And there are uh, like recently uh, uh, very uh, important works uh, changing different metals, like from aluminum to niobium, and also uh, to the tantalum, uh, which is, uh, has very nice oxide uh, properties on the surface. Uh, those uh, studies really enables people to find, for example, high quality, uh, to, to fabricate high quality um, uh, resonators, microwave resonators on chip that can, uh, for example, increase the lifetime of the qubits. And also like for our uh, experiment as well, like uh, maybe uh, also decrease the loss of the amount of material waveguide. So those are all very important uh, aspects in the experiment. And on the other hand, because uh, of those microwave resonators and qubits, they are sensitive to um, uh, 
those materials or like surface properties, uh, they can also be used as like sensors or indicators to tell us like what's the quality of uh, those materials and help us to find like different loss models, for example, uh, two level system or bulk losses uh, and other different type of losses uh, in those uh, materials and solid state systems. And there have been like many uh, nice work in those directions. So I think it's actually uh, kind of like two fields, like uh, like material science and uh, quantum uh, engineering. Those two fields like are kind of going hand in hand and advancing each other uh, to go forward. So I think those are very important aspects. Yeah, I, I can uh, broadly interpret your question as uh, which element would you want to use in your neutral atom array, uh, which is I uh, I would say a hotly debated uh, question because uh, different like startup companies use different elements. Um, but I will generally say that the summary of the landscape for neutral atom computing is that, uh, or quantum, uh, quantum information processors, is that every element has a number of advantages or disadvantages. Uh, and there's so many different complementary and compelling approaches to building uh, quantum systems from neutral atoms, some of which we're just continue, like discovering every week, like new ways to do a mid-circuit measurement using some sort of like a different element than we thought. And so I would say that because it's still so much in the nascent stages of this particular approach to doing uh, quantum information science, um, that there's still a lot of really neat ideas uh, to be discovered, uh, which will influence, okay, which element ultimately is the best way to go about doing it. Um, not, not to be said that certain things are just immediately better from the beginning, like a terbium, nuclear spin state, ground state, has no coupling to the tweezer, so it has a really long coherence time immediately. But you might be able to get around that with other like um, sophisticated ways to decouple your like ground state in an alkali. So um, I'll say there's immediately there's different advantages and disadvantages, but maybe there's tricks that you can play. Okay, so we're being told that we've run out of time. So uh, let's thank all the speakers again. Um, Yeah, and not just from this session, but all the sessions. I think it's really been a fantastic day. So thanks to everyone for coming, and uh, see you again next year. Oh. Before we, we get going, we're going to quickly go ahead and, um, you know, give the... Uh... Yes, <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and... Um, bring back up uh, Jay Lowell to uh, go ahead and award all of our um, all of our Creator Prize winners here. Uh, so first we'll begin with Sherry Zhang. Next we have Kevin Singh. Next, we have Nat Tantiva Serdin. <laughs> Shinghan Guil. <laughs> and then, last but not least, uh, Sebastian Gorgon. All right, with that, we're gonna go ahead and bring session three of the Boeing Quantum Creators Prize Symposium to a close, but we have a couple of words that are going to be said before we finish off. Thank you, Kate. And I know everyone is uh, raring to go. It's been a long two days. Just wanna say as we conclude uh, the 2023 uh, Chicago Quantum Summit, how impressive it's been to see these amazing and talented creators today. And, and really over the past few days, realize what an, a multidisciplinary field this is, right? The interplay 
between platforms and materials theory and experiment uh, that we got to see kind of in a different way yesterday and then today. Um, and then before everyone leaves, just want to give out a whole bunch of thanks, one, to all the organizers, the moderators, the sponsors, and others, including Boeing support of the creators this uh, today. I also want to flag really quickly someone who was not able to make it, who was really the person who started the Quantum Creators Prize, Hannes Bernin, who is on paternity leave right now. Um, um, and he was not able to make it today, but I think it's a really important thing to shout out that a few years ago he was the person who really came up with this, this idea to honor uh, these, these young, talented rising stars. Um, and then I quickly want to thank the whole Chicago Quantum Exchange team, David Shimomura, Becky, Meredith, and Megan, Andrea, the education team that was really critical for today, uh, Emily Easton, Russ, and Katie. Um, and then OUEC as well, including Tiffany, and a lot of these people are still, uh, you know, in the reception area. Um, David Alshlam and the rest of the CQE steering committee, um, and really you guys, the, the audience, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the more than 500 people that came here in person and virtually, over 30 countries. Um, and to especially thank those of you who are still in the room, because we like to feed you a lot. There are some light refreshments out uh, in the reception area. Thank you again. See you next year.